Scripture today will be from John chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. You can find it on page 98 in your pew Bible. Those, oh, you can be seated too. I'm sorry. Oh, is this stand up? You may be stand. stand up, sit down. All right, I'll start. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as in the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is a bread that came from heaven, not like which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe, and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? God, we praise your name for your revelation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the gift of your Holy Scriptures, which tells us of his life. May these sacred scriptures in this sacred place among the sacred people come alive today. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be nothing but perfect and pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I was on a bus in China. Yeah, I've, you're going to get sick of all the traveling stories I'm going to tell over the next uh, several years. So I was on a bus in China, and uh, we had just finished two weeks of backpacking. What we were doing, we were locating villages for full-time missionaries that were there, because China doesn't, too good, doesn't do too good of a job of, of knowing where these tiny, insignificant villages are. It's not that they're undiscovered, it's just that they could care less about their existence. And so the government doesn't put them on maps, but these missionaries want to know where they are because they want to know maybe someday they might have the resources to to go out and minister there. So they would ask college students from the U.S. um, to go, uh, and we were stupid, that's why they asked us this, um, but, uh, and they knew it, they would say, go on these trails and backpack for for two weeks in, in the middle of the summer in southern tropical China and uh, backpack through these mountains and find all these villages plot them on with GPS and take pictures and whatnot. So we did that over two weeks. After two weeks, we were on the bus going back to the main city. We were going to stay in a hotel for just one night and fly back to the U.S. the next day. And I was so proud of myself because I was the only one out of our entire group not to get sick. I was, I was ecstatic because everybody had, had gotten gravely ill. They had all lost 20 or so pounds from various bodily functions um, going all out of whack. And uh, I hadn't gotten sick at all. And we were on this bus. It was a long bus ride. And it was about an hour until our final destination. And all of a sudden, I started to feel a little rumble in my stomach. A little bit of nausea started creeping up. And I thought, oh my gosh, not here. Not now. Everybody else had gotten sick in the forest. And, and it was private and not at all humiliating. And uh, 
And here I was in public, not only on a bus, but in China, and this is, we learned this is common in North Africa too, but the particular area of China we were in, they didn't believe that having the windows down was good for you. They didn't like the moving air. They, even though it was hot inside the bus, there was no air conditioning. They would rather have the hot, dank, smelly, humid bus versus the fresh moving air because they felt that would give you a cold. So all the windows were rolled up. I knew I was going to throw up. And so I had a choice to make. I had a choice to make. It was coming. It was inevitable. A choice was going to be made where I was either going to contribute to the misery of the bus experience by throwing up on top of everybody inside, or I could open the window and pop my head out. So we get deeper and deeper into the city, uh, more and more surrounded by cars and many, many hundreds of people on bikes going back and forth. The time had come, a choice had to be made. So to this day, there are probably dozens of Chinese people that are furious with that one stupid white American who poked his head out of that bus and threw up all over their faces. That was me. And I confess to you and to the internet and to the world that I am, I am sorry. <laughs> but a choice had to be made, and I still feel like I made the right choice. Uh, that was a trivial choice, though. It's funny, I can laugh about it now. But sometimes we're faced with those choices, those inevitable choices that have to be made that have drastic consequences, more so than just half a dozen or so angry Chinese people who I'll never see again. Choices are made on a daily basis, and, and we have extreme choices in front of us throughout life. Choices like who we marry. Choices like what job we're going to pursue, what job offer we're going to take what college we're going to go to, what school to send our kids to, what to do with our savings, what to do, how to retire. And here in this passage today, at the end of John chapter 6, the crowd around Jesus, this crowd that we've been walking with and, and studying and journeying alongside for the past month, they're finally given a choice. For a month now, we've been with Jesus in this Galilean countryside as he's been revealing the truth of who he is to this people. We've seen him answer this question, who is Jesus? And today, we're not really answering anymore. We're going to ask the question, okay, if all these things are true, so what? What if these things are true? And if they are, what does that mean for us? We first saw Jesus answer this question of who he is when he fed up to 20,000 people in the countryside from just five loaves of bread and two fish. We saw in that story that he is the great I am. He is greater than any prophet. He is greater than Moses. He's greater than Elijah. He is the great I am. We then saw Jesus explain what this actually meant to be the great I am when he described himself as the bread of life. The bread that is freely given to you and to I and to the whole world with no work required from us. All he asks is for our simple, humble faith. We then saw Jesus explain that he is the great I am, he is the bread of life, but he is also the incarnation of God himself. God in human form, fully God and fully man all at once in the most perfect way imaginable that God can bestow his love and his grace. And then last week, we finally saw that this Jesus, this great I am, this bread of life, he is our one true home. It's in him that we truly rediscover who we are, that we, it's in him that we realize that we, each and every one of us, are created in the image of the living God. And it's only in him that we can truly rediscover that intimate, deep relationship with our Father, just as Adam and Eve had experienced in the garden. And each week we've been going through the story, we've been celebrating this meal of Holy Communion. And we have fully realized and experienced the presence of Christ, because this is one of God's greatest gifts to us, this meal of bread and cup. 
By eating of the bread and drinking of the cup, we're not just reminding ourselves of Christ's love. We are actively participating in it. We're being filled with the Spirit of Christ. We're being surrounded with the Spirit of Christ. We are literally communing with God the Father himself. As the hymn we've been singing for the past two weeks during communion says, Ye who believe his record true shall sup with him and he with you. And now, at the end of this chapter, at the end of all of Jesus' dealings with this particular crowd, we see him laid out on all of his cards. He has said all he's going to say. He's done all of he's going to do. And he now gives his people a choice. The rest are now in the hands of those who have seen his miracles. They've seen his teachings, and they now have a choice of monumental consequence in front of them. We hear in the first of this passage Jesus say one last time that he invites this people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. In verse 56, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. We've heard this time after time after time through this whole chapter, but he just had to say it one last time because he wants us to place our full and complete trust in him and in him alone. He's asking them to see him as the God that he is, to see him as the true and eternal bread of life, not not just a source of life, but the creator of life itself the redeemer of life and the sustainer of life and the resurrector of life. No amount of love can be earned from God. It is freely given to us. And Jesus is saying, please accept this love. He's begging them, please accept my love and my grace. Be transformed by it. Be redeemed by it. Be sustained through your life by the holy love of God. This is that moment in John chapter 6. This is that moment when a decision must be made. This is that moment when the people, like I've said, they've seen everything they're going to see. They've experienced all that they're going to experience. Jesus has given his sermon. Church service is over and a choice has to be made. Now, these, this particular group in John chapter 6 at the end, we're told it's not just the crowd anymore, but John specifically singles out a group called disciples. Now, in the book of John, disciples doesn't refer to the 12. It refers to maybe the few dozen, up to the few hundreds of people that were really pretty devoted to Christ. They were students of his. The disciples were not the apostles. When it says apostles, that's the 12. But the disciples, these were, these were large numbers of people who really loved Jesus. They loved his teaching. They, they were starting to realize the truth of who he was. They were starting to realize the truth of the life-transforming power that he had for them. But even these people, these people who, other than the 12 apostles, these disciples knew Jesus the best. Even them, in verse 60, they say this, Lord, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Jesus knows this. He knows what's in their hearts. He knows that his teaching is difficult. He knows the reality of what he's asking them to do. And so in verse 61, he pierces into the hearts of his disciples and he asks, does this offend you? Does my teaching, does my life, does the love and grace of God offend you? The word that John actually uses here for offend is scandalizo. That should sound familiar to our English, scandal. Is this message a scandal to you? Is it offensive? Is it repulsive? Is it repugnant to you? Because he knows what they're thinking. He knows that they realize this will forever change how they view the world and how the world views them. What we do here as a body of Christ each and every Sunday, each time we gather, what we do here is a scandal to the world. When we gather together with the call to worship, when our lay reader leads us in this call to worship, we're gathering together to say to God, to say to each other, and to proclaim to the world that there is nothing more important than what we do here and now. 
We are saying that God has called us together as one body to proclaim his glorious name. To say to him, Lord, I would rather be here than anywhere else. You are more important than my job. You are more important than my family. You are important than any recreational activity I might want to do. This is what you have called me to do here today. Amen. Amen. This is what we are called to do here today. And when we gather with that call to worship, that's what we're affirming. Does this offend you? Is this a scandal to you? When we gather together and we corporately give back to God through our tithes and our offering, we are being a scandal to this world. We're telling this world that we are not a pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps type of people, but we are telling the world that every good gift that we receive was always God's in the first place. We are simply stewards of it. They are generous gifts that we are called to wisely take care of and to use them to further advance the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And Jesus asks, is this a scandal to you? Does this offend you? When we pray together here at the altar and when we confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness, we are saying one of the most scandalous things we can do in today's culture. We live in a culture that is more and more growing and turning into this culture that says everybody should just do whatever makes them happy because that's what's best for everybody. We are learning we're, we're, we're learning to, to turn into this people that just lets people do whatever they want. Yet God reminds us that it's not our pleasure that's our ultimate goal in life, but his. When we confess our sins to God, we acknowledge that our pleasure is not the goal of human life, but rather the goal and point of human life is to be in deep, intimate, loving, and holy, sanctified relationship with God. And the amazing result of that is that that's where true pleasure will really come from. But this is a scandalous thing. Does this offend you? Is this a scandal? To you. Ultimately, the scandalous choice before Jesus' disciples is this Will they choose to give up their lives fully and ultimately over to God? Will they see themselves as not their own, but truly belonging to God the Father Almighty? And will they fully and completely trust Jesus with their lives? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? which you have been given from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now so often, too often, we look at this passage and we think Peter, uh, sorry, Paul is specifically referring to our individualistic selves. Now there is a hint of truth in that. God does dwell in us. We are individually a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. But more importantly, what Paul is saying here is that the church universal is the body of Christ. One thing that the English language doesn't have is you plural. But guess what? Texan has a you plural. So I'm going to translate this. This is Kelly McQuaig's official translation of the Greek into Texan. Y'all are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Y'all are not your own. Y'all were bought with a price. You see, this is a scandalous thing. It was to them 2,000 years ago, and it is to us today, because it's calling us outside of our individualistic, selfish selves. His disciples realized that they were being called out of their individualistic ways, and they were being only concerned with themselves rather than being concerned with holy love of God and holy love for each other. Scandal after scandal after scandal, this message that Jesus has is wrecking the selfish, legalistic lives of Jesus' disciples. And for so many of us today, it does the exact same thing. Jesus knows it, and the people know it, and they have a choice to make. And they make it. In verse 66, At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. For these people, 
for, for these people that have followed Jesus for so long, who have come to know him so well. They've come to know him as the great I am, the incarnation of God, the one and only way to the Father, the bread of life. It was simply too tough to swallow. And I think we can all think of people who've made similar choices. People we know, friends, family, loved ones, who we, we know they've tasted the sweetness of Jesus, yet they've turned away from it because it's like bitterness to them. And it's so easy to be frustrated with those countless upon countless people who just, just keep turning away. Jesus just lost most of his congregation here. It's that drastic of a situation. Yet, does Jesus dwell on this? Does Jesus mourn the loss of so many of his followers? Does he, does he go into some committee meeting and try to come up with a new model of how to be in ministry? No. He understands to keep the first things first. He understands that God is calling him, Jesus Christ, to keep the focus on him, the Son of God the Father Almighty. And after his disciples have turned away, I don't know how many, but it could be so many people, after his disciples have turned away, he now turned to those remaining 12. The remaining 12 who have witnessed so many people turn their backs on Jesus, and he asks them, are you also going to leave? Are you also going to leave? Hilltop United Methodist Church, are you also going to leave? Are you going to turn your backs? Are you going to turn your backs against Jesus in the midst of a culture that wants you to do just that? That wants you to turn away from this thing we called faith? Are you going to resist the scandalous gospel of Christ? Or are you going to claim it as your own? Are you going to adopt Jesus' scandal for your own? Are you, going to carry his, are you going to carry the cross of Christ on your back and walk alongside him on his journey of holiness and sanctification and self-sacrificial holy love? Again, this is more than just a question to each one of you individually. This is a question to all y'all. All y'all as a body. What are y'all going to do what are we all going to do together? Are we going to walk away just like everybody else? My prayer and my hope is that we stand firm in the truth of Peter's response to Jesus' question. When Jesus asked his 12 apostles if they too are going to abandon, Peter gives one of the most amazing lines in Scripture, in my opinion, verse 68 through 69. Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I love that. Lord, to whom can we go? What other choice do we have? What other option is in front of us? There aren't any other options. You are it. Just as the disciples made their decision to turn away from Jesus, the apostles make just as consequential of the decision, but they realize now that they have truly and completely tasted the goodness of the Lord, and that they've truly experienced that there is no turning back. They've seen Jesus for true he truly is. They've seen him as the great I am. They've seen him as the bread of life. They've seen him as the incarnation of God himself. They've seen him as their one true home, the only way that they can rediscover the image of God within them, and the only way to God of the Father Almighty. And they see here and now that he is the only Holy One of God, just as Peter said he was. Jesus, who is Jesus? He's been sent by the Father. He's been set apart for the holy work of saving the entirety of all of creation. And he invites each and every one of us. He invites all y'all to be set apart for holiness right along with him. To join him in all of his sanctified holiness. To love God with holy love. To love the world with holy love. And to transform the world for his holy love no matter the cost. No matter the shock, no matter the outrage, no matter the scandal. The world is walking away from Jesus. 
The world is turning their backs on him because his message is just too hard. Will you do the same? Or will you truly taste and see that the Lord is good? Amen.